Hi, it's Idris Elba here with Booking.com, and I wrote this poem about summer because I love summer. <clears throat> In summer, we do things to feed the soul, and Booking.com knows just how we roll. We love to swim and fish and barbecue. We love to read and nap and have a few. With cabins, resorts, yurts, and vacation homes, it's such a breeze to book. Where shall we roam? I know it needs some work, but thanks for listening. Find your perfect place to stay. Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for baking your way here on this toasty morning. Are you all ready to jam? Excellent. Before we get rolling, let's start by hashing out everything Bagel will be discussing. Profit margins are okay, but they could maybe be butter. Sorry, I don't mean to waffle. Next quarter, it's all or muffin. Did you have a question, sausage patty? Um, my name's Patricia. When you can't take your mind off breakfast, it matters where you stay. Delicious breakfast available at our Hilton family of brands. Hilton, for the stay. Martyrs and Missionaries is a production of Revive Studios. You're listening to Martyrs and Missionaries. I'm Elise, and every episode I bring you a new martyr and or missionary, the called and the brave. In this episode, we're exploring Henry Morton Stanley's trek to find David Livingston. All right. First things first, I know that I have been gone a while. I think it's been about six weeks. We were in the middle of moving from Cambodia to Indonesia. A lot of you know that I was in Cambodia for the past year. And if you want to know why we are now in Indonesia and not in Cambodia, you can actually follow us on our Facebook page. I will link it in the description if you'd like to follow along. I know that several of you are already members. My goal is to get you two episodes a month, and I am really excited. And I hope that you guys are equally as excited and that I have assuaged any fears that you have. So without further ado, here is part two, Henry Morton Stanley. In the mid-1800s, Africa was pretty unknown. It was very unexplored. It was really only known for being a a very dangerous place to go. It was the kind of place that if you were headed off on an African expedition, you signed your will, you kissed the wife and kids, and you said, I'm, I'm headed out and I probably am not going to come back. You had to get your affairs in order. For example, the death rate of the four expeditions that Britain had sent to the Congo, Zambezi, and Niger between 1816 and 1841 had been 60%. So when you went to Africa, you loaded up on quinine because that's the only reason those people survived uh, because malaria was just such a rampant thing as we will see going through uh, Henry Morton Stanley's story. I mean, it's something that apparently you contract every five seconds. It's, it's incredible that these expeditions had any success rate, to be honest with you. Now, to give you some context on entirely how new African exploration was to Europeans, In 1841, and this is the year that Stanley is born, Livingston stepped ashore at Cape Town for the first time. Livingston, as you know, was the guy that opened up Africa. He's the reason that Africa was put on a European map and it was filled in and it was no longer just this weird shape that people were like, what is what is going on in there? We don't know. Livingston was that guy. Now, if you recall, in part one, Stanley was sent out to look for Livingston by his boss, Jordan Bennett, who is the head of the New York Herald. He's kind of an arrogant guy, but he has a reason to be arrogant. He is one of the most successful newspapers in the world. And he had told Stanley, before you go straight into Africa looking for Livingston, kind of go around a few other places, let the interest in Livingston die down and then head to Africa and begin preparing the trip. So Stanley did just that. But when he arrives in Zanzibar, he has no money from Gordon Bennett at all. And this is incredibly insulting. He had to rely on credit from the U.S. Embassy and just hope that Bennett fulfilled it. Compared to any of the previous expeditions, even accounting for inflation and things like that, Stanley was still woefully underfunded. So it's incredible that he was successful at all. 
He was prepared to bring 120 men, and he did his research very carefully. In his book, he's a bit more bombastic, like, I did this and this and this, and this is all the things that I prepared, and he made it sound like he had no idea about Africa whatsoever, but in fact, like, he did his research very carefully. So all of those expeditions that went on before him, he had their books, and he had all the notes of things that would be useful to know, and he perused those and poured over them and made so many notes that he was prepared down to the exact number of bolts that he would need to make this expedition. So he was very methodical. As he's in town and he's preparing stuff, people know he's up to something. You can't exactly prepare these kind of trips without somebody catching wind of what you're doing. You're not going to go completely unnoticed. But people had no idea what exactly he was doing. He kept that very, very secret. So people thought that he was just planning this unimportant uh, river venture, which is you know, not that big of a deal. Not going to cause any ripples. But there was a man in Zanzibar whose name is Dr. John Kirk. He's a medical doctor. He was Livingston's botanist during the Zambezi expedition several years ago, and he was considered to be a friend of Livingston. And as you'll see, he's not exactly a great friend of Livingston, but he he knew what Stanley was up to. He just had this sixth sense. I don't know if he'd been tipped off by somebody, but he just knew. And he gives Stanley the last known itinerary of David Livingston. And he tells Stanley that Livingston is on the west side of Lake Taganika. And he's headed to Ujiji, and he has four months travel from where Stanley is currently, which is not great news because he could go anywhere in four months' time. You could miss each other. It could go terribly wrong. Africa is a huge place. And you're looking for one guy. So it's, it would be very easy to miss. He's literally a needle in a haystack. And Kirk also gives him other advice, which turns out to be kind of a bit biased advice because he says that Livingston is prickly and kind of uh, doesn't like other people, gets very jealous, things like that. And so he might run away the instant that he sees you. So in the back of his mind now, Stanley's thinking, okay, so he's four months travel from me, but also the instant that he gets wind that I'm after him or something like that, he could run off uh, anywhere because he doesn't want to be found. Maybe he doesn't want to be found. And that was something that he had not factored into his equation. But nevertheless, he had no choice. He was still going to go after this. And so he begins to hire people that he thinks would be good to add to the team. So he hires this sailor. Uh, he's an excellent navigator and mathematician, but he has some vices. Uh, he is a, a well-known alcoholic, and he also has no experience in Africa. So he's really good at what he does, but he's never done it on this continent. And we're going to call this guy Far Kahar. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but nonetheless, that is what we're going to call him. The other guy he brings on is a man called John Shaw. And John Shaw is good at sewing canvas and tents and sacks, and he's also a drinker, uh, and he also liked the ladies of the evening. The third person to round out their team was the VIP. He was the most important guy. And he served as the personal servant and translator to Stanley. His name was Salim Heshmi, and he was a Syrian Christian teen. And he had been with Stanley for over a year. He'd gone with him through Jerusalem, Iraq, Russia, Persia, India. And now the thing that Stanley is looking for is obedience and discipline. These things were paramount to him because it's something not only that he prided in himself, but he realized one of the things that go wrong, especially in these African expeditions, is these men lose their, um, they just lose a part of themselves and they kind of unravel. And when you're sick with malaria, you're sick with dysentery, you don't really much care for the social order of things. And so you, you tend to come undone pretty quickly, which can completely wreck an expedition. So that's what he was looking for was obedience and discipline. And I will tell you, he did not find it at least in two of these gentlemen and many more of his caravan as well. And going back to Dr. Kirk, he is a lousy friend to Livingston. So Livingston had these supplies sent to him from England, and they were just kind of left to rot uh, sitting there in Zanzibar because it wasn't a priority to Kirk. Kirk thought, ah, I'll just leave them here for a few months. You know, they'll get sent out eventually. I have a hunting expedition to get on. And so they got left. And Stanley was very upset about this, but there wasn't really anything he could do about it. And so he says, the best thing I can do is just kind of spur ourselves forward and we'll get there to Livingston and resupply him. 
The last thing Stanley does to prepare as they're rolling out is he staggers his caravans so as to avoid attack. If somebody sees a large number of caravans coming, it makes you an easy target. If you're a small caravan, you probably don't have anything worth attacking. So that was the idea there. So Stanley leaves with the fifth one on the 21st of March, 1871. And in his personal caravan, there are 10 carriers, people to bring along all the goods. There are nine soldiers. There are 17 donkeys, trade goods, portable boats, uh, and Henry rode on an Arab stallion while his dog Omar trotted along beside him. This is roughly five years after the Turkish debacle. If you remember, that went terribly. Um, and you would never have imagined this guy five years later would be going on the quest of a lifetime to find Livingston and doing it so preparedly. However, unbeknownst to him, Livingston was headed in the opposite direction. He was looking to find the mystery of the Nile's origins once and for all. Now, what's a little bit ironic about that is that the source of the Nile was found in 1858 by James Speak. But Livingston thought he was wrong. Speak said the source of the Nile is Lake Victoria and Livingston said, no, no, it's further south. Now, Livingston was wrong. In fact, he thought it was way further south than it actually was. Um, but he was determined to find the source of the Nile because he thought with 100% certainty that James Speak was wrong. Stanley knows none of this, obviously. He is in high spirits. Everybody is hopeful and jubilant. And imagine just seeing all of this wildlife, all this African wildlife. You're seeing giraffes, you're seeing zebras, you're seeing elephants, lions, leopards, all the things that we take for granted because we have them in zoos. You're seeing out in the wild. And that would be absolutely incredible, at least from a, a far way. You wouldn't want to be, you know, up close and personal, but you'd be just looking at these majestic animals. So how could you be anything but jubilant? The world is your oyster at this point. But within mere days, two of Stanley's horses have died from tsetse flies, uh, several of the donkeys too, and they'd only gone 125 miles within about 10 days. So that's not great progress. And to make matters worse, the cook was wasting food, which on an expedition like this, that is a death sentence. And so Stanley decides that he's going to try to pretend to expel this guy, to excommunicate him, kind of kick him out of the caravan, which would also be a death sentence, right? And then to kind of bring him back in with this like harsh, like, don't you do that again kind of attitude. But the cook just deserts and he leaves him. So after losing the cook, they marched for five days through this knee-deep water and black mire, just through these clouds of mosquitoes. And as you can probably imagine, everybody contracted malaria, dysentery, and smallpox. You may not have guessed the smallpox part, but with that many mosquitoes, malaria is kind of a given. Now, due to all these things, Stanley drops from 170 to 130 pounds, and one of the carriers died of dysentery, as did his puppy, Omar. Stanley himself was almost killed by his feverish young servant, Salim, who accidentally misfired his weapon in some of the, just a feverish kind of uh, hallucination. The entire caravan was experiencing these insane visions and brain throbs and sickness. They became paranoid and hostile. They were sensitive to light and loud voices. And also, and this is kind of surprising to me when I read it, I was like, huh? They were jealous and paranoid of healthy people, which is kind of interesting. That's not really a symptom you would think of. And I mentioned earlier that these kind of African expeditions, due to all the illnesses, is really trying on relationships. James Shaw and Farquhar were also just having some major issues. Shaw was racist, he was drunken, he was mutinous, he was promiscuous, and he couldn't do anything right. Now, Farquhar had these swollen legs from this tropical disease, and he was just blowing through supplies and food, and he was abusing these donkeys and not, like, you know, beating them, but he was a big guy, and he kept riding on these donkeys, but he'd ride them until he killed them, and he had just, just going through so many donkeys, 
and this was obviously upsetting to Stanley, they ended up having to leave Farquhar with a village chief. And this is actually a common practice back in the day. If somebody got sick on one of these expeditions, you would just kind of leave him with uh, a village chief. You would give them kind of enough um, money and supplies to take care of him, and then he would hopefully get picked up um, by a caravan kind of heading back. Now, in Farquhar's case, he died five days after being left with the chief. Stanley himself had this unique restraint and discipline, probably due to all the things that he had experienced in his life. And he really had no patience with people who didn't have that same level of discipline and restraint. And so this also was trying on these relationships. On June 23rd, they're two-thirds of the way to Ujiji. They had marched 525 miles in 84 days. And two weeks before they arrived in a town called Tabora, men began to desert in mass. They were now down to 25 men, which if you recall, that's about 100 down from where they began. When they arrive in Tabora, these Arab traders are there, and they tell them that Livingston is dead. And this is a conflicting report with another one, which said he'd shot himself in the thigh hunting buffalo and planned to return to Ujiji when he recovered. Yet another said that he was in Manjima with only three followers, and with so few people, he would never make it back to Ujiji. So these are all very troubling things for Stanley to hear, and they're all very conflicting. And as if everything wasn't going so poorly before, war is brewing between the Arab traders and an African warlord named Mirambo. The Arabs, for quite a while now, have controlled the gold, slave, and ivory trade. And Mirambo is thinking that he can get the upper hand on that and kind of control that flow himself. Marambo is well-renowned for being a skilled fighter, a, a very tenacious individual, and he gets what he wants. So this is not exactly good news for Stanley, and he's blocking the way to Ujiji. So the Arabs were successful in convincing Stanley to fight for them because he really needed that path open. He really couldn't risk delaying, and Bennett, his boss of the Herald, withdrawing his support. But Stanley and Shaw are still very sick, so really all they can lend, and they added a few more men to their number, but they're still only at about 50 men. So they go out to the edge of town, and they're able to uh, work Marambo's troops into a retreat, and everything's going swimmingly. But in fact, Marambo, being a skilled tactician, had tricked them into thinking he was retreating and attacked them. And so Stanley would have been left behind if it wasn't for Salim, his translator, who heaved him onto a donkey and took him away. The Arabs were losing these battles soundly. Several days later, Tabora was sacked and a quarter of the town was burned. At Revive Studios, we're excited to have partnered with Christian Healthcare Ministries to help spread the word about their amazing health cost sharing ministry. Partnerships like this help us keep the lights on over here. That being said, though, we are picky. For example, you will never hear me advocate for me undies or blue apron. It has to be something we think you will like because we respect you and your time. Christian Healthcare Ministries is a budget-friendly, biblical, and compassionate healthcare cost solution for Christians in all 50 states and around the world. So for listeners in Alaska and Hawaii, you're in luck. There are also no restrictions for CHM membership based on age, weight, geographic location, or health history. CHM is a ministry that seeks to help people. For over 40 years, they've satisfied billions in eligible medical bills for hundreds of thousands of Christians. So could you or someone you know benefit from joining CHM? Check them out today. Visit chministries.org slash podcast to learn more. Welcome to the Everyday Hotel. You'll be on the second floor and your other room will be on the 14th. Wait, we asked for connecting rooms? These are 12 floors apart. We tried, ma'am, but technically they're only 11 floors apart. We don't have a 13th floor. <laughs> we can't be 11 floors away from our kids. I don't see a problem. Stuart! When you want separate rooms, but not that separate, it matters where you stay. Only Hilton offers confirmed connecting rooms at the time of booking. Hilton, for the stay. Dr. 
Dr. Kirk's men had finally decided to bring Livingston his supplies, and they also ended up in Tabora. Stanley took over those supplies, and he waited for Marambo to attack, hoping that the 50 men he had would at least discourage a frontal assault. Now, what he didn't know is that Marambo would just burn them out, and then their bodies would be mutilated, their faces, genitals, and stomachs would all be boiled and eaten with a little rice and goat meat, like what they had done to the Arabs earlier. Stanley luckily seems unaware of this fact, and for reasons unknown, Marambo retreated. He had them in the palm of his hand, and he could have just gone in there and just completely taken over the city, but he just kind of pulls back, and no one's really sure why. I'm not sure if Marambo goes on to have control of the area or not, but for our purposes here, Stanley and his crew are safe. But they could no longer take the direct route to Ujiji, and so they'd have to kind of route around the war entirely, which led them to go 10 days out of the way and then march directly again. And by the 7th of September, they were already down from 50 men to 33, and they were in some dangerous territory, and they were very, very small in number. While they're traveling, Stanley bought the freedom of an 11-year-old slave boy and named him Kalulu and employed him as a personal servant in a gun carrier. He does actually take this boy back to the States with him and kind of, he is his son uh, for all intents and purposes. Shaw and Salim become dangerously ill again, and they were forced to delay, which has just got to be killing them, because who knows where Livingston could be at this point. And also, you'd just be tired of being sick constantly. On September 19th, his fever left, Stanley's fever left, and the others had improved enough that they were able to go out on the 20th of September. And the night before they head out, he writes this by candlelight. I have taken a solemn, enduring oath, an oath to be kept while the least hope of life remains in me, not to be tempted to break the resolution I have formed, never to go up the search until I find Livingston alive or find his dead body. No living man or living men shall stop me. Only death can prevent me. But death, not even this. I shall not die. I will not die. I cannot die. You can kind of read that in this, like, this guy is very resolved. And it's true that he is. Like, he is very, very, very disciplined and very strong. But on the other hand, it's this desperation, this I have to find him. I cannot die. You'll notice he says die like three different times because this expedition has been so terrible and you've just seen so many people around you just die in terrible ways and you're afflicted with all of the things that keep killing other people. So in this way, it's this desperate plea, like, I cannot die before I find Livingston. Like, maybe afterwards, but I cannot die before I find Livingston. So where was Livingston at this point in time? Because last we heard, he could be anywhere. He could be dead. We don't know. But right before um, Stanley had headed out in March, Livingston spent months bedridden with dysentery, anal bleeding, flesh-eating ulcers on his feet, and he's entirely and incredibly depressed. And as he's sitting there just bedridden, he becomes convinced that the Nile source was way far south. And he only has about 13 followers. And so when he gets back, like all of his people have either deserted or they've kind of been lost or killed, very similar to Stanley. Um, and so when he heads out, he's, he's like, I'm going to get a canoe. I'm going to go and I'm going to find this thing. But as he kind of comes up to this lake, he sees this just gigantic massacre. In the market, there had been some Arabs and some locals who'd gotten into an, a fight, and the Arabs fire their guns into the market, and they send all the locals kind of fleeing into the water, but they can't swim. And there's also all sorts of things in the water that you don't really want to swim in there. And so estimates of the death of that massacre are about 600 people. And so after Livingston saw that, it just took such a toll on his body and on his mind that he was unable to complete his journey. He said, I have to turn back. I can't do this. I don't have the stomach for it. You know, the things that he saw were just so terrible. He just kind of gave up. And this was just devastating to him because he, he was going to go back to England, basically. At this point, he was thinking, I'll go back to England, but I'll go back as a complete failure because I didn't find what I set out to do. 
And this is just horrible for him. But due to this total loss and change of plans, he heads back towards Ujiji. Stanley strikes out again, and as he goes out, he's had this, the, all the same problems as before. There's desertion, there's illness, all sorts of things. And Shaw actually has to be left behind because any more marching would have killed him, and Stanley gets malaria again. But in late October, he learned that a white man with gray whiskers had just arrived at Ujiji, and so that's just invigorating. And they made haste. They rushed out and they're like, okay, let's do this. We're a few hours from Ujiji. And so he makes himself presentable. He oils his boots. He chalks his helmet, which apparently is a thing people did. And he puts on this flannel suit. And Livingston had just arrived at Ujiji and he was literally just dying on his feet. His supplies had been pillaged. His money is gone. Stanley knows none of this. He writes later on, he says, At this grand moment, we do not think of the hundreds of miles we have marched, of the hundreds of hills we have ascended or descended, of the many forests we have traversed, of the jungles and thickets that annoyed us, of the hot suns that scorched us. At last, the sublime hour has arrived. Our dreams, our hopes and anticipations are about to be realized. He is elated. And when he arrives in a town, it's this this just magnificent uh, parade of people. The American flag is waving. He looks just, you know, very dapper in his suit. It's just this just amazing thing to see. If you're, if you're Livingston and you're just thinking, how am I going to survive? I have no money. I have nothing. And you see this expedition, you know, coming your way. This is just the best news you could have ever received. And so Livingston is very excited. And now this is the point of the story where I think we're all familiar with the famous phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume. And I have to bust some bubbles because he never said it. It never happened. He'll tell you he said it, but it never happened. And there's a story behind this. Uh, basically, he wrote it in a letter back in New York. He, he put it in there. And it actually made him kind of a laughing stock because everybody was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like that, that just sounds so wooden. Um, and there's actually no reports of it, like earlier in his reports, like he, he says nothing about this. So all of his like, you know, actual you know, diary entries and things like that, which is very specific. He says nothing about it. Um, it comes much later and he actually, like I said, becomes a laughing stock and he can't really take it back. It's much like his name. Once it's out there, he can't really take it back. And so he never said it. Um, and in fact, that's actually good that he didn't say it. it. It just sounds very arrogant, right? When he met Livingston, it was just an incredible experience. He had no idea what to expect. And Stanley is very nervous. This is a legend. And he's meeting this guy. Livingston is just very cordial, just such a nice, like a gracious, welcoming older man. And he asks him, you know, what's going on in the world and Stanley's like, oh, I have this stack of letters for you. Do you want to read them? And he's like, no, I can wait. Like, let's talk. They have some tea and they just catch up. And it's just, it's wonderful. And Livingston really takes a shine to Stanley. He tells about everything that he's been up to, which is something he's been very cagey about with other people. He just opens up to Stanley in a way that he had not done previously. And likewise, Stanley is also very transparent with him. And together, they form this relationship that's very similar to this relationship that Stanley always wanted, which was this uh, paternal kind of relationship. And it, it really is something that formed very quickly. And this is also a moment where Stanley's faith kind of transforms. Now, I wish there was some letter I could show you or something like that. And I looked, and I think it's kind of locked behind stuff I, I don't have access to. But you can see just in the heart change and in the way that he talks and in this success, the fruit of his missions in Africa, which we'll explore in the next episode, that this was a moment, a turning point in Stanley's life where he does take his first steps towards becoming a believer. It's a slower kind of process for him. There's no quick turnaround. But I think as you'll see in part three, this was a real genuine heart change for him. And he had a lot of impact in Africa for the gospel. Stanley tries to convince Livingston to return to Britain because he has these hemorrhoids and all this hemorrhaging and he's poor. Um, but Livingston is very 
stalwart. He says, I can't go back. I would go back as a failure. I want to see if I can explore the source of the Nile. I have so much work to be done here. And Stanley cannot convince him to go back. But likewise, Livingston says, hey, you want to come with me? We can explore and see if we can find the source of the Nile. And Stanley is very tempted by the offer, but he can't. Because if he leaves on a two-year adventure, because these things take a very long time, then no one would know where he was. He would lose the support of Bennett and everything that he was working towards would actually just completely go bust. But he does end up compromising and spends a few months exploring the local lakes and regions and things like that with Livingston. And he writes about that, about all the things they saw and this beautiful friendship that blossoms between them. But in March, they had to part ways because Stanley had to head back. Shortly before they're set to part ways, he writes this. We both think our thoughts. What his are, I know not. Mine are sad. My days seem to have been spent far too happily. For now that the last day is almost gone, I bitterly regret the approach of the parting hour. I now forget the successive fevers and their agonies, and the semi-madness to which they often plagued me. The regret I feel is greater than any of the pains I have endured. On the day they parted, he says, We wrung each other's hands, and I tore myself from him before I unmanned myself again before others. But the doctor's faithful followers then came to shake and kiss my hands before I could turn away. Goodbye, doctor, dear friend. Goodbye. March, why do you stop? Go on. Are you not going home? We came to a ridge. I looked back, and I watched his gray figure fading dimmer in the distance. I gulped down my great grief and turned away to follow the receding caravan. He also writes the next day that he just felt this deep emptiness and this loss. And Stanley knew they were never going to meet again. Livingston was far too frail. The chances of him actually completing this adventure he was on were slim to none. And indeed, 13 months later, Livingston died and they never met again. Livingston did pen two letters for publication for the Herald. Uh, Bennett paid more than the cost of the original expedition for those two letters. And they were telegraphed to New York to protect the greatest news stories of the century. And you have to imagine if you're the telegrapher, like you're just, that's a long day for you because those are probably some very lengthy letters. He penned exposés of the slave trade and also told of the massacre that he had witnessed. Finding Livingston made Stanley, as was expected, entirely just world famous. His boss Bennett tells him, you are now as famous as Livingston, having discovered the discoverer, accept my thanks and the whole world's. On July 24th, he is back and goes all over. He is in England. He is in the U.S. He is touring everywhere. But in fact, he's miserable because number one, he just doesn't fit in in high society. He's not that guy. And he just makes a lot of social faux pas. And his Welsh history is kind of making the rounds. He doesn't want that known because he has has created this whole persona of himself as an American. And so his house of cards is very close to, to kind of collapsing on him because if they hear about that, then they'll know his name's made up and his story is made up. And there's just, there's just so much about that that he doesn't want to happen. And so he's very nervous And he just doesn't make a good impression on people. So he's just a complete wreck. Now, what's interesting about this is before he headed out to find Livingston, he was convinced he wanted the fame. He wanted the glory. And when he got it, he hated it. And it wasn't what he wanted. It wasn't what he thought it would be. And even his boss now hates him because Stanley was more famous than him. So whereas Bennett thought, ah, the Herald would get all the praise. No, Stanley got all of the praise. And as Stanley had left Africa, he said, I'm never going to go back. I don't want to go back. I do not like this place. This was terrible. As much as I love Livingston, no thank you. Not going to do it. But his time kind of making the circuit and just being completely miserable, this thing that he wanted had turned to ash in his mouth, he began to think of Africa. And I think this is sometimes God makes us miserable to kind of get us where we need to go. I know in my life sometimes I think I want something and then I get it and I realize, oh, this is not what I wanted at all. And that's the kind of stuff God uses to shift you where he wants you to go. And this is exactly what happened with Stanley. 
On February 25th of 1874, Stanley hears the news that Livingston was dead. And he writes Livingston's daughter Agnes, and he tells her all the things that he's feeling about how amazing her father was and how sad he is to hear of his passing. And it's then that he resolves himself to take up the mantle. Now that Livingston's gone, he says somebody needs to be there to open up Africa for Christ and Christianity, and he decides to be the guy to do that. And here begins Henry Morton Stanley's greatest adventures yet. And with that, we finish part two of Henry Morton Stanley. And I really enjoyed this one because you get to see that kind of change in him a bit where he's looking for fame. He wants this thing. And then when he meets Livingston, he realizes like this guy is just so much more than I ever imagined. And I would love to be a fly on the wall of any of their conversations. That would be just really cool. But part three is probably going to be just It's going to be harrowing, it's going to be intense, it's going to be thrilling. And I know that you're thinking, how can it get any more wild and thrilling than parts one and two? Let me assure you, it can and it will. And I am excited to share it with you all here in a couple weeks. And I thank you as always for listening to Martyrs and Missionaries. I'm Elise. Searching for just the right job? Whether you're looking for full-time, part-time, or seasonal work, you can get started today. Amazon Jobs offers the whole package with great pay and flexible shifts that allow you to choose when and how much you work. Find a warehouse close to home and discover the role that works for you. To get your application started for an hourly job, go to Amazon.com slash apply. That's Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is proud to be an equal opportunity employer. I'm Major Selba, and this little journey of words is brought to you by me and Booking.com, but mostly by me. Now, imagine you're on vacation, you and your favorite peoples. Beachside bungalows, perfect weather, the smell of barbecue, barbecuing on the grill. Eh, you know the smell. Whatever your vibe is, it's probably just an easy click away. Because with over 28 million places, chances are we've got the perfect place for your next trip. Come on, you know you need it. Find your perfect place to stay. Booking.com. Booking.com. Yeah.